Hello, guys, and welcome to our first true crime episode on Spill the Tea with B&T. I'm your host, Brooke. And I'm your host, Tori. We want to start off with a warning that this episode does contain graphic content that includes torture, murder, and sexual assault. If any of these topics disturb you, please click off. Before we get started, we do want to say that this is going to be a lot shorter of an episode than the rest of our True Crime Tuesdays, and that's because the lack of information on this case, we used multiple sources including news articles, news videos, books, and other written statements, and even with all of that, we still couldn't get a lot of info. So today's case hits close to home, literally. Most of you probably already know that Tori and I are both from Utah, and we've actually lived here our whole lives. I even currently live in Ogden, Utah, where this takes place, and I only live 12 blocks away. So, let's set the stage. It all started on April 22nd, 1974. Two workers, 20-year-old Stanley Walker and 18-year-old Sherry Ainsley, were working at the Hi-Fi Shop, a local audio and video store here in Ogden, Utah. Sherry was newly married and actually just started her job at the Hi-Fi Shop only a week before this incident took place. So, just before closing time, two men came into the store and forced Stanley and Sherry downstairs. They tied up the two workers and began to rob the store. But they were interrupted by 16-year-old Courtney Nasbitt. He came to thank the workers for letting him park his car there earlier in the day. When the robbers saw Courtney, they took him and tied him up in the basement along with Sherry and Stanley. Finally, when Stanley had not returned home from his shift at the store, his father, 43-year-old Orrin Walker, became worried. Ten minutes later, 52-year-old Carol Nasbitt came looking for her son, Courtney, as well. As you probably guessed, when they arrived, the robbers took their parents and tied them up in the basement as well. So now Stanley, his father, Oren, Courtney, and his mother, Carol, and Sherry were all tied up in the basement of the hi-fi shop. One robber came down with a brown paper bag, and in the bag was a bottle. He poured the cup of blue liquid, which was later found to be Drano, and demanded that Oren give the liquid to the hostages. When Oren refused, the robbers took it upon themselves to force each of the victims to drink the liquid, telling them it was vodka laced with sleeping pills. The victims' mouths started blistering and burning. The robbers even attempted to duct tape their mouths to keep the Drano in, but the wounds on their faces and mouths prevented the tape from sticking. They gave Oren the Drano very last, and since he saw what happened to everyone else, he let it drain from his mouth as he mimicked the convulsions he had seen the others have. The robbers were getting upset now. They felt like this was much harder than they originally expected. The victims were taking too long to die, and they were too loud. One robber took a gun and then proceeded to shoot Carol and Courtney Nasbitt in the back of their heads. He then shot Oren and Stanley Walker. These gunshots would be fatal for Carol and Stanley. However, Courtney and Oren managed to survive. Then the same robber that had just shot the four other victims took Sherry to the corner and sexually assaulted her. Oren said that she left clothed and came back completely naked, where they dragged her naked body to the others and shot her in the back of the head. Oren later said her last words were, I am too young to die. When the robbers saw Oren still hadn't died, they tried to strangle him with a wire and finally took a ballpoint pen and stomped it into his ear. Thinking the job was done and their victims were all deceased, they went upstairs, loaded their van with more equipment, and left. The entire robbery and attack lasted two whole hours. The robbers escaped with over $24,000 of stereo equipment. It was three hours later when the rest of the Walker family came looking for Oren and Stanley. There are conflicting reports that say they broke into the back door when they heard noises and called police, while other reports say that Oren actually made it to the parking lot where his family discovered him. Carol, Stanley, and Sherry were all pronounced dead. Stanley and Sherry at the scene, while Carol was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Oren survived but had extreme damage to his mouth, chin, and ear. Courtney also survived despite spending 266 days in the hospital with severe and irreversible brain damage. He later required surgery to replace his esophagus from the Drano, and his father described the state of Courtney as, he's here, but in some ways it's almost worse than if he had died because he's not normal and will never be normal. So, who were these robbers? Well, an anonymous tip came in two days later from someone at Hill Air Force Base, which if you guys don't live here or don't know what that is, it's a military base located here in Utah. Someone had found personal items of the victims in a dumpster located at the base. The officers who searched the dumpster had a realization that a man named Dale Pierre Selby, who was a suspect in another case, lived near the dumpster. When they got a search warrant for Selby's apartment that he shared with fellow airman William Andrews, they found a lease agreement for a storage unit a block away from the hi-fi shop and the gun that was used in the crime. 
When they entered the storage unit, it was filled with hi-fi equipment. That's when police knew that they had their murderers. So during the trial, Selby would later describe his childhood as strict and claim this possibly contributed to his future behavior. He claimed that he remembered shooting Nazbit and just started shooting everyone else. He said that he got the idea to give the victims Drano from a scene in a movie he had saw. Andrew Williams had a different approach to his trial. He pointed the finger to Selby, claiming he was the one to pull the trigger that night. Oren was the only one of the two surviving victims to testify at the trial. He tearfully described the events that he and the other victims endured, including the murder of his own son. Selby and Andrews were both found guilty and sentenced to death. There's actually more to the story than just that, or should I say, more people to the story. Most people often forget that there was a third defendant in this case. His name was Keith Roberts, and he was found to be the getaway driver for Williams and Selby. Some even claim that he was the mastermind that came up with the idea to rob the hi-fi shop. However, everyone maintains that Roberts never entered the store that night, and he served 13 years in prison and was eventually paroled in 1987, which means he's still possibly walking the streets to this day. Yeah, we actually have no information whether he's alive or if he's passed away by now. All the reports that I saw was after his parole, he moved to Oklahoma and actually has been a very good parolee since, but we don't know if he's still out there today. Both Selby and Williams were executed by lethal injection, since that was actually the only option that Utah had at the time. We now have lethal injection and firing squad, but when this happened, neither of them had that option. It was just lethal injection. So Selby was executed August 28th, 1987, and his last words were, I'm going to say my prayers. Williams was executed July 30th, 1992. His last words were, Thank you to those who tried so hard to keep me alive. I hope they continue to fight for equal justice after I'm gone. Making them two of only 44 people executed in Utah, compared to Texas, who has executed 569 people. It's actually quite controversial that Williams was executed since it was said he never pulled the trigger, and that was a huge defense in all of his appeals, which he obviously lost. Um, Courtney Nesbitt and Orrin Walker both passed away in the early 2000s, leaving no remaining victims of the brutal hi-fi murders. The craziest part of this story is that it takes place where, like I stated in the beginning of the episode, Tori and I have lived our entire lives, and it's really not talked about much. I actually only heard about it when I was looking around for recommendations for a speaker for my car, and my dad had asked me if I had ever heard about the hi-fi shop and the incident that had occurred there. I learned about it actually just a couple years ago, so I overheard my coworkers mention something about it, and then I looked it up and I was shocked that something that brutal wasn't more talked about, especially like Brooke said, we've lived here our whole lives and we've never heard about it until pretty recently. And there isn't actually a lot of coverage on it, even though it's such a brutal case, especially since the hi-fi shop does exist to this day, just in a different location. And that concludes our episode for the hi-fi shop murders. We hope you guys enjoyed and make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter for updates and polls on which cases you guys would like to see covered in future episodes.